Welcome to today's episode of the People of Fishing podcast. I'm Chris Kingry, as always, your host. And today I've got a Bassmaster Classic qualifier local to the Florida area, Rich Howes. How are you, Rich? <laughs> What's going on? Man, it's awesome to get you in here and uh, and kind of go over what, what you've done in your, your lifetime. I've I've only known you a few years, but it's been it's been a interesting few years, <laughs> um, and uh, so I just wanted to bring you in and kind of go over some of the things that you've experienced along the way, and, and yeah. talk about you know your daily life and things that brought you to bass fishing in general. Yeah, no, I'm excited to be here and uh, seeing the first couple. It's been fun to watch, and uh, yeah. happy to be a part of it. So we, we've traveled together and not, not necessarily together, but we've always ended up somehow at the same <laughs> locations, same, uh, and, hotel or lodge. And things like that. Yeah. Um, Rich is a Bassmaster Opens pro and has fished for how, how long have you fished the Opens? Uh, I think this is the seventh year, I believe. So when did you qualify for the Bassmaster Classic? What year was that? The event that I won was. In February of thirteen, so I fished the February fourteen classic. So that and that was at Kissimmee or uh, Toho. Toho was where I won. Yeah. So your your home lake. And, yeah. Well, and, technically Kissimmee is right. where I was. But right. Right. <laughs> we launched right. out of Toho. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rich is the man at uh, at Kissimmee, um, and the king of patience is what I like to call him, uh, <laughs> because he's like the the grounded roots for everybody that we we travel with and the. <laughs> voice of reason <laughs> <laughs> talk talk everybody off the ledge <laughs> <laughs> so when talk me through that uh that experience of of you know start to finish and in, in your opens career i guess so like when you when, when you first started the opens what what did that look like to, to you what made you start yeah so um I, i'm going to take you back a, a few years before that event when i first started fishing uh beyond the BFL level, I guess you would call it. Mm -hmm. You know, like so many, I started uh, in the back of a boat in the BFLs in the early 2000s. After a couple of years, jumped to the front of the boat. Um, and, you know, it was always make the regional, yeah. you know. And it was more about making that regional, and it was like a vacation in the fall. And I always looked forward to that. Like, I'm not going to try and win. I'm just going to get enough points yeah. so I can go – out of Florida in the fall and fish for something big. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, I did that from probably 2002 or 2001 might have been my first year. And, you know, I made eight straight regionals or nine straight regionals. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. And I loved fishing for that All-American and for the boat. And it just got your competitive juices flowing. Mm -hmm. um, around that time, 2008 or nine. Uh, I switched my style of fishing and I decided, all right, I'm done fishing for points and I'm going to try and make money. And so I changed my uh, tournament philosophy to try and win versus just come in with a limit. Uh, and I hit a couple big wins, um, won a couple $10,000 tournaments, uh, you know, uh, kind of a state championship type stuff. And got a taste of holding the big check over my head. And at that point, I was like, you know what? I'm going to try and take the next step. In uh, 2010, I believe they had uh, the FLW Series. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember. They had, the like, FLW Open Series? Uh, yeah, it, was kind of, it wasn't the tour, but they had like four events out mm -hmm. west and four here. Yeah. And I jumped in the Okeechobee one. And so you're fishing for $100,000. You know, Scott Martin won that one. Mm -hmm. Uh, back when John Cox was a young boy and, yeah. and he was, you know, I remember him leading that tournament for several days and then Scott got him at the end. But, uh, you know, I thought, wow, this is really cool. I knew that I didn't want to like fish a tour and make it my life, but I was like, man, I, I love fishing these big events. What else is out there? Do I go up to the Everstart or I don't know what they call it now. Uh, the Toyota series. Yeah, the, the yeah. AAA level of FLW. Yeah, was the Costa Series, not the Co Toyota yeah. Series. Yeah. So, uh, so then the Opens, you know, kind of popped up in my head. And I said, well, why don't I try this, uh, you know, the Bassmaster stuff. I had won a couple of the ABA uh, events. Mm -hmm. And so I signed up for the Open tournament on Toho. I think it was 2011 or 12, the one Swindle won. 
Mm -hmm. And I just signed up for that single event and fished it and just had a blast. Um, and of course finished in 41st, one spot out of check. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I had that taste of, wow, I can actually, you know, it's one thing when you fish FLW, but when you switch to the bass side and then the Bobby lanes and the, right. the Chris, Chris lanes, lanes and yeah. the Aaron Martins, uh, just, it's a different feel. And I was like, man, that was so cool. So, yeah. uh, that was the first open I ever fished and did well. Uh, I then had a couple knee surgeries and, uh, had some business things that kept me from doing it. Well, I targeted 2013 to, I want to fish the whole year. Mm hmm and travel and do all that. Uh, and then I happened to win the first one of 2013. So that was the second That's a open good start I ever for your first one that you're planning to fish all of them. Yeah. Too. Second open ever, yeah. um, you know, and won it. And, you know, from there, uh, you know, you get the ticket to the classic mm -hmm. and, you know, it's interesting when in the first one, you have an entire year for it to sit on you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Um, but what's great about it is it gave me a year to, tackle the business side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was, I was very good at uh, capitalizing on having a year, uh, upgrading sponsors and, you know, getting all the other things set up. So who was your, who was your first big sponsor that you would say that, that kind of put you into the taste of the business side? Uh, you know, you have the, the discount programs right, that yeah. are around. And the way uh, I look at those is like, it, it depends on how it's going to benefit you on what you put a value on. Right. So like if you're going to buy lithium batteries anyways for your boat and you get a 45% discount or a 30% discount, that's huge. And in, in, in that it's very helpful. And you know, if I'm going to, I'm buy them anyway, sure. I'll promote them. I mean, yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, the, the first, like uh, the first paying sponsor mm -hmm. where they actually give you cash. Right. Um, right you know, happened during that year. Okay. Um, so I had, uh, I've, by trade, I'm an insurance agent and uh, I work with a lot of different insurance companies. Um, and so I started calling insurance companies mm -hmm. to say, hey, do you want to take part in this classic thing? Uh, reached out to two or three of them and got the farthest with Allstate, which mm -hmm. happens to be who we write most of our insurance business with. And ended up with the national marketing director of Allstate. And that was my first, you know, taste of you're going to sign a long contract. Right, right, you're, right. And we are going to control the narrative. And you have to do this. Uh, and came with a large chunk of money. Uh, right, right. So, you know, I, I once I landed that one, I knew I was set uh, from there. You know, I then got other paying stuff, you know, from Fitzgerald and... Mm -hmm. uh, rattle trap and a uh, whole host of others. Right. Right. But all state really, you know, and, and in comparison to the amount of money that you make from the smaller ones, it was, it was very big. And right. they stayed with me for, uh, three years. Mm -hmm. And, um, I actually introduced them to the Bassmaster folks. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, uh, in 14, 15, and 16, maybe Allstate was a presenting sponsor. Oh, okay. I got gotcha. you. The Bassmaster. Wow. Opens. So you made that kind of made that unofficial I, link. Yes. Yeah. I introduced them and helped facilitate it. You know, it wasn't just because of me, but. Right. Uh, right. And that's a big part to, to, you know, on both sides of the, the page where, you know, your history goes with, with uh, Bassmaster and, and also Allstate for, you know, helping your sponsor out to mm -hmm. find new channels of marketing and, and obviously it was something that they saw as a, a good fit, not yeah. only by you being there, but, you know, mm -hmm. promoting for boat insurance and absolutely you know, so, other avenues. You know, when I fished the classic, I was, you know, my, my boat was fully wrapped in all state. Uh, it was kind of comical because uh, the say the classic that I made was the first year that Geico became the like major sponsor of the classic. Like it was the Geico Bassmaster. All right. Classic. Right. And, uh, and I'm being pulled through the arena in an all-state rap boat with an all-state jersey and all the the big Geico reps are you right. know, in the stands, like in the VIP seat, seat, uh, seating. And mm -hmm. uh, I made a few uh, funnies while, while doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, would you say that, that that experience caused it to um, take it from an out-of-pocket experience to a, uh, a role with 
you know, relying on sponsors to fish at that point or. Yeah. For, from, from then on, uh, it, it doesn't be, it's not a family expense. Right. It's, right. Yeah. And that makes it a lot easier to justify that you're, you know, traveling that many times a year and the, taking the time off from away. work to do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, that, that way it's not money out of your pocket to, to, yep. to do it. And, and I had always in my mind, uh, right or wrong so this isn't a, a, to cast judgment at all yeah absolutely when i won i had a three-month-old daughter that she had just been born uh she comes with some special uh special needs and i knew there was going to be a lot of expenses mm -hmm. and so i always told myself if i'm having to dig into nora that's my daughter if yeah. i'm if i'm digging into her medical savings I, i'm not going to fish right so right um once I secured the ability to fish these and make money, whether I cash a check or not, then I was kind of all in and uh, made the deal with my wife that I would not try to go full time. Um, it's not really a desire of mine. I go fish these three or four a year. Right. I right. disappear for a week and then I come back, but I don't fish. Like a mini vacation. It is, but I, I don't fish often throughout the rest of the year. I'm right. not spending every Saturday getting ready for the next team tournament. Yeah. Um, and, and so that, that's been our, our deal, family deal, yeah, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, uh, the, the time off is always, it seems to be the hardest part for people. And, and some guys that I've worked with that I always tell them when we do things with them, as far as sponsorship stuff that, uh, to, to secure that part uh, and just in helping coach them a little bit, even mm -hmm. is I always tell them the first person they should go look at is somebody they work for. Mm -hmm. because, and give them the first right of refusal because that's, you know, that's going to be more of a benefit to somebody like them because you have a personal interest mm -hmm. in promoting them because it enhances your job security. And you know what they do and yeah, absolutely. what, you know what better spokesman, about, exactly. you know, to, and that's the way I went uh, approaching Allstate. It was like, can you, could you have a better representative than the guy fishing the classic who's also sells your product right uh, so now did you have an all state all state office at that point um yeah okay so you're yep. an agent at that point yep so we have uh as far as the family businesses we have uh, all state agencies we have uh, benefits enrollment uh firms that my brother runs uh, so both in the health and employee benefit arena as well as property casualty which would be the all state portion of it so. right how, how did you get into insurance what 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 threw you into that that mix <laughs> uh so my father was a uh a music professor at delta state university in mississippi uh, cleveland mississippi okay. and uh they don't make a lot of money and he eventually you know I, he's all the way to where he was like a doctorate of music or whatnot mm -hmm. so but he eventually he's he started, he opened up an insurance business kind of, it's with Colonial Life and Accident. It's kind of like an Affleck, the supplemental stuff. Yep, yep. That's when those first started coming out and the IRS made some tax changes that allowed corporations to utilize something called a Section 125. I don't want to bore you with insurance talk. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear it all the time. My, my wife's an insurance agent. So okay, no, that's right. I, I, I get to listen, listen to insurance at home all the time. All right. She's going to kill me right now. Good but, for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, he got into that and had a really great, successful career. And uh, once I got out of college, I was playing guitar and singing in bars for a living. And... I needed to do something with my life. He said, well, go get an insurance license. I'll introduce you to somebody. Go do part-time, see what you think. And that's what started it. That was like 1996 or 7, something like that. And the insurance is what eventually moved me to Florida. Um, right. this, I, this was up in Ohio at the time where I was uh, playing guitar and whatnot. And so in 2000, either 99 or 2000, um, I took a position with an insurance company that brought me and moved me to Florida. So, I gotcha. Yeah. So when, when somebody's shopping for boat insurance, what are like the top things that you would recommend to look at um, for, for somebody that's uneducated and what they're looking at? Cause I know a lot of people that shop for it. They're, they're like, I'm just going to get the bare minimums cause you know, ah, it's not required and this and that, but except in tournaments, obviously we're required <laughs> to have liability and all that. Right. But um what what would you say uh, as a professional in the industry 
of what you would recommend for everybody. <laughs> and I, I see your rants on Facebook about the, the full coverage and, uh, and all of the misnomers over the years. So um, uh, it's something that, uh, you know, I'm in insurance, so obviously I'm very biased. <laughs> but <laughs> people, whether it's your boat or a home, mm-hmm. so you think about the investment and in money that you make for a boat, especially a new boat. I mean, if yeah. you you go pick up a $60,000 rig, that's a lot of change, yeah. right? And you're going to be with that thing for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing with buying a house. So you buy a house, a lot of times it's it ends up being uh, one of the bigger assets in a family's life. And the first thing you say is you call somebody and you say, give me the cheapest worst insurance that you got that doesn't make sense to me like <laughs> you 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 go through all this to get a boat right. or, a, or a home and your immediate thought is give me the cheapest thing you got that so i always like time out <laughs> let's not go with cheap let's first work with understanding what the coverage does yep. and make sure that if you have a claim or something happens we don't make this a financial disaster as well as an accident. So, yeah, yeah, because uh, you don't buy it for you know for planning on having an accident. It's what it's when right. you really need it. <laughs> You're right. So sometimes we'll get calls. You know, hey, I got this extra coverage and I haven't even used it. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> means your rate's going to be cheaper. <laughs> what that, that means you didn't get into an accident. Like yeah. you don't want to use this. But so to answer your question. Uh, When it comes to boats specifically, uh, there's something called agreed value versus uh, actual cash value. And basically, an agreed value, let's say you had a $60,000 boat and you work with your insurance agent or company or little lizard online, (laughs) and you say, I I bought this thing for $60,000. If it was totaled, Mm -hmm. I want $60,000. Right. And boats depreciate very, very quickly. Um, especially in the first four or five years. Right. So if you uh, get an agreed value policy, you're guaranteed that payout in the event of a total loss. If you don't get that particular value, you get something called actual cash value. And that is going to include depreciation. Okay. Um, I call it garage sale rates. Right. So um, let's take this uh, you know, brand new Triton. You spent 60 grand on it. And in six years, it's totaled due to an accident, you're either going to get 60 grand, which will more than pay off your note and probably put you into another boat if that's what you choose, or you're going to get 25,000 because it depreciated that far in seven years and you still owe 50 because you put it on a 30 year note or a 20 year note. Uh, That's the biggest risk is how quickly these things depreciate. So always make sure you're getting an agreed value uh, for the amount that's going to cover your your uh, note, your, mm-hmm. your loan. So, so liability-wise, um, I know there's probably a lot of people that just do the bare minimums. It, now, we're recommended, I think, was it 100, 300 or something like that to fish the opens and fish? 300,000 300, is what 000. the tournament organizations uh, require. Realistically, what does that cover? I mean, I know I know it sounds like a lot of money, but in the, in the you know, essence of medical expenses or whatever else it comes down to when it's not your life, it's somebody else's. Right. Um, what is that actually, is that a, a proper amount or is that something that people should look higher to? 300 would be the absolute minimum. I would recommend somebody. Uh, you first got to understand what liability insurance mm-hmm. is, and this will apply for your boat or your home, uh, in your auto insurance. Uh, if you were to injure somebody, whether it's in a boating accident or a car accident, and I hurt somebody and I'm responsible for their medical bills. Mm -hmm. If you have $100,000 coverage, basically that means your insurance company is going to pay for the first $100,000. Okay. You are going to owe the rest. I got you. So if you're comfortable, you know, you put somebody in a hospital for a week and the bill's a half a million dollars Mm -hmm. and you're like, why don't you guys just cover the first hundred? I got the rest. <laughs> That's what you're saying. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> same thing with with cars. You know, yeah. um, same thing. You know, if you if you're carrying ten thousand dollars of bodily injury limits, mm-hmm. and you hurt somebody, how quick is that ten thousand dollars gone? 
uh, yeah, know, an yeah, X-ray absolutely. and a Advil at a hospital, and you're already out of pocket. So um, now, when when you're towing and and stuff like that, does that go towards the vehicle insurance? Like, let's say you're getting an accident towing down the highway. Does that your does, vehicle? Your vehicle picks up that that part yeah. of it. So, yeah. like, if I let's say I had you know one company covering my boat, another company covering my truck. The, the, the one covered my truck would then... For the liability. For the liability. I yeah. got gotcha. you. Yeah, but if the boat, you know, flipped over and got totaled, then you would you would switch to your boater's insurance. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yep. So just think about liability is I'm going to cover... The insurance company is going to cover whatever you select. You owe the rest. Right. And if you feel like you are... You know how to get into an accident and keep somebody's medical bills under 10000 or 50000 <laughs> Quite a specialized thing. <laughs> a, quite, quite a quite a technique. I haven't learned it yet, and, uh, but that's why you see all the you know the Florida's full of the lawyer signs. You know, yeah. So yeah. and so got me ambulance chasers and five hundred thousand yeah, or yeah. whatever. So uh, you just you want that liability portion to at least rhyme with the kind of coverage you want. Right. You know, right. Uh, you don't have to be a millionaire to be sued like a millionaire. Yeah. Um, and the more assets you have, certainly the higher it, it needs to go. Right. So, uh, tournament organizations do three hundred thousand. Uh, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. You know, I carry five hundred. Right. And I actually have an excess liability on top of it. Uh, now, realistically, to go from three hundred to five hundred, in most cases, I know it's not an exact number, but uh, about how much more do you think the rate is? Uh, on a premium, roughly difference ten dollars a month, and so that 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 was kind of what I was getting at was, it, you know, very minimal. Yeah, so I mean, that's one trip to McDonald's these days. Yeah, so most insurance companies, uh, the first hundred thousand cost the most, but if you went from a hundred to two hundred thousand, it's not twice as much expensive. Right. So yeah, and I think that's something that people always look at too when they're getting their rates is they. They're trying to save here, save there, whatever, for their monthly expense because they don't want to think about what's going to happen. But then, like, when you really look at it, like, you're – and I think, that obviously, they probably realize that when they're quoting those rates, too. So that's why the first part's the most, you know, expensive part of the policy, and mm-hmm. then the, the the upgrades are actually minimal compared to what you've already put in. Absolutely. So yeah. it's almost like you might as well just take it the extra step and you know pay the extra couple hundred bucks a year. Just cover it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean you're spending sixty grand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, why are you trying to get the worst thing possible? Yeah, somebody told me once uh, on on one of the offshore charters here uh, that he goes to the Miami Boat Show every year, and he's like, he's like, you guys are running these charters and half a million dollar boats. He's like, you don't buy the ten thousand dollar lifeboat that pops up he's like right. it's ridiculous yeah and so it's it's things like that that make you kind of think about all that stuff it's yeah. like the time you don't need it you know and that's the the, the non-fishing career that i have that, that's what i do all day every day is try to you know uh help people with their insurance understand their finances what it truly means um you know and we do a lot of financial planning type stuff as well so. right right so the uh Getting back to the the fishing side of things, mm-hmm. I know you're probably bored of talking about that because you <laughs> say it every day, but I think it's really good information for people listening that they need to, that, you know, remember that part of it and any anybody, and there's a lot of people that just have a boat without insurance, like if they don't fish, you know, where they're required to have it. Yeah. And um, I don't think anybody thinks about that part until it's too late. Yeah, no, I mean, what there's... Because there's no requirement, you know, to do that unless you've got a loan. In most correct. Cases. Correct. Correct. The, the I would at the very minute, even if you have an older boat that you're mm-hmm. not concerned, just get some liability. Yeah. You know. You, yeah. If you don't care about the replacement value because it's a five thousand right, dollar boat right, or something right. like that. But if you if you lose control and you hit somebody, you hit a jet ski, maybe yeah. on purpose because they're <laughs> annoying you, uh, or you know you you hit somebody skiing, you hit anybody. Yeah. I, geez, I mean, you hurt them. It's coming out of your pocket. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary. What what can you and, know. you know, they, they can garnish wages for 20 years, uh, you know. So That's insane. Um, so after the Classic, or actually tell me more about the Classic. Like, what, what did it feel like <laughs> when, you, when you got there? Yeah. So, what, what does that feel like to, to pull up and, you know, you, you're pulling your first limit of fish through? Yeah. So it, what was, uh, what I always say about the Classic is it's everything that all the fishermen dream about. So when you... 
right now you you think, man, how awesome would it be to fish the classic? It is awesome. And it's this experience I wish I could put in a bottle and share with my friends and people that are passionate for fishing. Uh, but, you know, I'd say most people are never going to have that opportunity. Right. There's 50 of them mm-hmm. a year. I mean, it's, it's just it's an amazing thing to be a part of. Um, pulling through, you know, and, and through the bright lights and all that with, with your fish, it's, it's just overwhelming you get a sense of uh accomplishment like wow and and they will tell you um in some of the pre-tournament stuff like hey you have a bad day remember you're in the bass master classic don't don't come up and humdy dumb and be upset because you had a bad day because everybody looking at you wants to be where you are yeah Um, so I, I made a pact to myself. A, uh, I was I was going to do everything I could do to win, and I took several trips up there to get to learn a place I'd never been, um, because I didn't want to have the event and uh, look back in my life and go, man, I really could have done a lot more to try to do well. Like, yeah. So I, I forced myself uh, to to put all the effort I could into it. I forced myself to fish to win. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and did that and had, you know, uh, I got to experience the, the greatest high mm-hmm. of being in contention to win it to the greatest low of completely bombing the second day. Right. And uh, it was just, it's really cool. The whole week is really special uh, from uh, visiting uh, sick kids in the hospital mm-hmm. uh, with some of the other anglers, mm-hmm. you know. Um, you know, we, we went to one of the hospitals and they grabbed uh, me John Cruz and uh, Edwin Evers mm-hmm. and took us to the terminal level floor. Mm-hmm. And we went around to all these kids and just to see them light up and you know their situation. You know, so a lot of emotions from that all the way to the fishing experience. Right. So I don't think I don't think a lot of people know about that part that, you know, just watch it on TV. Right. I don't think that gets contrasted as much as, you know, the uh, whole the, the other the other things that go on yes. behind the scenes. Yeah, media day, you know, the day with the kids. Uh, you know, not everybody does that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. But during that week, Bassmaster does a lot for that community that mm-hmm. is hosting them. We'll put it that way. You right. Know? So media day is really cool. You know, um, it's just an incredible experience. And, uh, you know, I always, uh, one of the real popular uh sports writers said, you know, people spend their whole life to get here and they fish it one time and then they spend the rest of their life trying to get back. Yeah. Because yeah. it's so cool. I've, I've heard that about even uh, guys locally here that have fished Na- uh, Bass Nation Nationals mm-hmm. um, and they they made it there once and now they're like, I've got to go back. I got to do I, I yeah. was so close to getting there and now I've got to go back. Yeah. And I was certainly like that the first uh couple years afterwards it was kind of like you know i know i can do this again i know i learned so much you know yeah, learned yeah. so much and uh you know and almost did it a few times but yeah. uh you know haven't done it again um been close and uh gonna keep fishing as long as i'm enjoying it yeah um uh, and feel like i can compete yeah absolutely um i think that's that's part of the the thing that you know if you lose the fire, then what, why are you still doing it? Right. And that's kind of what Rick Clun said when he won on the St. John's river, he, he walked up and he, uh, I remember seeing an interview with him on, I think it was the third day or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, he had, you know, he had, uh, actually it wasn't an interview. It was his live camera and he had put like a four or six pounder and somewhere between there, he was catching giants down there. And, uh, he came up and he was shaking and he looks and he said, I'm going to keep doing this till I stop feeling that. Yeah. Yeah. And that was like, that was the real, and he's like a real, you know, he's hung on for a long time. And <laughs> he's Rick Clun. I mean, every, every time you think that he's like, oh, this is the year he'll retire. And then all of a sudden he like comes out and wins one out of nowhere. And you're like, oh my goodness. He's, yeah. he, I, I would agree uh, with the great Rick Clun. Uh, yeah. You know, if I go fishing open and I hook a big one and I'm not, jacked up and shaking mm-hmm. then i'll know it's time to be done <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so since you've fished one uh bassmaster classic uh what do you think 
that's going to look like now. A lot of people said that when the MLF thing happened and everybody left and this and that, do you think it's going to be the same fishing against, you know, the, the guys that are, I, there's some really great anglers that have come to light now that, you know, the field loosened up a little bit. Right. And that may not have ever seen the starlight, I think, that they've they've seen. But now that we've been introduced to these new guys, what do you think that feels like when you don't have the KVDs and the, you know, the, the what used to be the big promoted names? Um, ask there. me a tough question, huh? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have friends that fish both, so I'm oh, gonna, yeah. let's see, let me put my... And, uh, and I'm not casting any shade my, on either side. My it's politician just, hat on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I think it's great for the sport. The MLF. Mm -hmm. uh, there is more money for more anglers to live their dream or do what they like to do. So I think that's great. Will it diminish the accomplishment or the the classic, as you say? Uh, I, I don't think so. And, and if it does, it's very minimal. Mm -hmm. It's still incredibly hard to get there. Uh, they the production that Bassmaster does for those events is uh, just as important as the anglers that get there. So mm -hmm. I, I guess what I'm saying is I think BASS is bigger than the names that used to be there. Okay, and I think it will it will be just fine. It's about hanging that trophy over your head. That's exactly what it is. Um, and I also think that MLF can do great mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think what's overlooked, and uh, this is just me ranting about fishing, is it, it's a completely different sport. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's imagine if we change the rules of football to the team who had the most offensive yards wins. Yeah. It's a different sport, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you, you used to have some of these teams that their offense was terrible and they relied on their defense and special teams, and they would win 7-3. to three. Yeah. Well, imagine if the, the most first downs wins. And that's, in essence, what has happened. It's a different sport. You fish very differently. Um, and so growing up, uh, the way I've tournament fished, it's always been just, I'm just trying to figure out how to get the biggest bite. Yeah. And so, you know, personally, I would be terrible at it. Um, but there are some guys that doesn't matter. They're incredible, and they'll catch 100, or they'll catch the biggest because they're yep. just bad to the bone. Weed you know, through the numbers. The Brian Thrifts and, and the Jordan yeah, Lees. exactly. They can Jacob do whatever Wheelers. the heck they want. Yeah, yeah the Wheeler. Uh, incredible so yeah. um i know there's a long-winded thing to say i i think the classic will continue to be uh the pinnacle well and i think still i mean those guys that made it there still had to qualify they still had to fight to get there oh yeah and and i think it's you know brought you know the, the other guys were great but i think the new evolution of anglers also are are really showing off you know that they've really like destin to marion He's one that I've always paid attention to over the over the years. He's, uh, you know, fished fished with him in the opens and whatever. He's he's put his dues in as far right. as opens go to make the elite series and come up short so many times. Right. And you just it pains you to watch that guy because he's like <laughs> he's a very good fisherman. Yeah. And in the off season, he I think he guides on the St. Johns River and stuff like that. And there's a lot of incredible fishermen out there, uh, uh, more than you would ever know. Yeah, you know. Uh, there's just yeah guys at the club level even that that could absolutely. compete at a, at a national level that absolutely you know. and that's that's why I say the MLF is great because it's more for yeah. more people I mean that's yeah now you have the new NF uh, NPFL that's they're talking league. about and it's gonna yeah. be another league and who knows if that I mean yep. they, they could go out and you know be the the next best thing or mm -hmm. they could you know flop like you know, other things have happened. And I think there are guys that are figuring out that the, the game is different at the MLF level. Mm -hmm. You had Swindle came back and yeah. uh, Polinick came back. Yep. And I know a few others that are trying desperately to get back. Mm -hmm. It's That's what they want to do. That's the game they want to play. They don't want to get the most first downs. They want to go for the five biggest. Yeah, and, and, the, and some of the things I've heard, too, that makes a lot of sense is, like, if they hadn't gone in the first place, they would have never known – you know, what yeah, it could have been. Absolutely. And, and it still can be phenomenal. It's still a, uh, you know, tremendous organization. Um, you know, Boyd Duckett is an incredible businessman, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and 
you know, they have the money, the support, and they've got great anglers over there. And then you got some guys that'll try to do both. Yep. I mean, yeah. So you got John Cox that's doing FLWN bass yeah. this year, and I mean, heck, he just showed up to the the uh, what was it the uh, the the championship for the super tournaments mm -hmm. and didn't even practice. <laughs> he he went straight from one event straight to the other. Didn't never even practiced, and then he's second day of it. He's leading. Yeah, there, yeah. there's a that's just one of those uh, gifts. Yeah, you know. Uh, there is, there is separation in anglers, and there's uh, what's interesting about our sport. Uh, two, uh, two things. So, most fishermen, whether they fish in their backyard or not, when you look at bass fishing on TV, you say, I can do that. When you watch LeBron James, you're not looking at the TV saying, mm -hmm. I can do that, because there's a physical difference. Right. Right. Um, but, but. Fishing doesn't have that huge separation. Like, obviously, I'm not 6'6", six, six and I, you know, I can't shoot from half court and make them all the time. Right. Uh, fishing is different, and everybody thinks they can do it. Yep. Uh, so it's it's a uh, different kind of sport, so to speak, right. when it comes to that. But there are guys, like, the, the, there's a reason that the same guys win a lot. Yeah. And it's not because of luck. There is, of course, a factor of luck uh, with fishing, but you'll notice the same guys are always yeah. at the top, typically. One that really impressed me was uh, Brandon Lester. He is like one of the. Uh, he he I, is. Remember on Champlain? Phenomenal. On Champlain, I drew him, and you looked at me and you said, "You're gonna have even if you suck today, you're gonna have the best lesson you've ever learned." Yeah. And you were 100 percent right. Yep. I, uh, I learned. We we fished in 60 foot of water all the way to three foot of water. He is one of the most well rounded uh, fishermen. There is. He's always uh, in the in the in the contention. Every, every tournament he's in, he's in the contention for yeah. sure. And so he's one of those guys that, you know, when when the two leagues split, he was already on his way to be a superstar. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I don't think we're going to lose too much because the Brandon Lester's were already beginning to take over. Yep. In my opinion. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, but like you think of the guy, the the Florida guys, John Cox and Bobby Lane. I mean, I could pour a bottle of water in the corner of my living room and they'd go catch a fish out of it. <laughs> Just incredible instincts and, and all that. So, so in Kissimmee, mm -hmm. you are like the well-known guy for, you know, punching, flipping, and having the most patience doing it of anybody I know. <laughs> and I've never seen somebody that can literally break down water and, you know, decide this is where I'm going to get my five big bites, and and really, and and you and I practiced with you my like first year on or second year on the opens, um, on the Harris chain. And, oh, that's right. Yeah, and that lesson. You were bored to death, weren't you? <laughs> no, it was so interesting. And actually, and and the funny thing is, I don't even know if you remember this, but you've done seminars at uh, Bass Pro um, every now and then uh, in in Kissimmee, and. The first time I saw you was at a seminar at Bass Pro when I had just started fishing. Oh, cool. And it was like, I don't know, I think I just, it was my first year bass fishing. And I saw you up there, and I think it was probably a couple years after you'd gone to the Classic. Mm -hmm. But they were doing a seminar, uh, a tank seminar. You get up there, and you bob the baits in the tank and whatever. Um, and it was on dead sticking. And that was the most interesting seminar I've ever watched in my life. Like everybody else is like, is this serious right now? Are the guy's going to throw a bait in the bottom of the tank and it's not going to do anything? Like what, what what's this going to do? And I, I got to watch you tell about how the bait, you're like, watch how this bait, you were so confident about it too. You're like, what? Well, especially in a tank full of fish that were ready to eat something. But um, you're like, watch what this bait's going to do. And you drop it in there, drop it to the bottom and you're like, you'd think I'm going to do something with this bait, but we're going to sit here and you'd go like this and, you know, put your arms up and you're like, I'm just going to, we're going to wait and see what these fish do. And they like, amazingly enough, the fish like all like decided to start moving in slowly to the bait. And you're like, you think it's ready to move yet? And everybody's like, yeah, let's do something. And, uh, and you didn't move it. You're like, no, we're going to wait a little longer. And then you're like, now when I pop this bait, something's going to eat it. And you, popped it and sure enough one just out of the six fish looking at this thing one of them just went over and demolished it right 
And uh, that was one of the most interesting seminars I've ever watched. <laughs> That's very because cool. Because you actually got to watch the way the fish reacted to a bait. And you sit there and you go, how many fish have I put a bait in front of that didn't eat what I had to give because I was in and out too fast? Yep. Uh, especially in Florida. Uh, you know, that is a big time Florida lesson. Um, you know, Florida tends to, uh, you win on in areas, mm-hmm. not necessarily a pattern. Yep. And so that's why you see like the monkey box or, you know, North shore or uh, North cove. It's an area. And so, you know, my, my lesson in all that is if you know, there's fish there when you're fishing in a bass pro tank, you know, there's fish, you can right, see them. Right. But if you have had a practice that you know, there's fish, then there's no reason to leave and you can wait them out and you can dead stick and you can do things when the bite turns off and it gets cold front uh, it's still possible to, to get them. <laughs> now on, on Kissimmee, the, the thing that always troubles me about flipping Kissimmee or flipping anywhere is choosing bait size and bait colors. What, what goes through your head when you're, you're choosing that kind of stuff? Uh, I'm not a color guy. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not one to have pens and dyes right, right. and all of these types of things. It's Florida, June bug, June bug red. And, you know, watermelon type colors. It's just one of those. And if it's super clear water, I may throw in a watermelon. But for the most part, it's just black, blue, June bugish. Um, the thing that uh, I, how I decide what to use has to do with the aggressiveness of the fish time of year. So mm-hmm. uh, it's no secret to me, the BB cricket is like, that's my jam. I mm-hmm. love gambler BB crickets. And that's how I won. Um, you know, one flipping stick on the deck and a bag of BB crickets. And I never made an overhand cast the entire tournament when I won. Um, and cold front, cold water, uh, pressured fish. I'm always going to use a downsized type of cricket thing. Mm -hmm. Um, you can bop up to a punch skirt and a beaver and, and larger stuff. Uh, when the fish tell you like, they're just going to jump on it right away. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, you hear about di- downsizing all the time, downsize your line, downsize. A cricket is a downsized, it's finesse flipping if there's such a thing. So the, the weirdest part for me is like, I know a lot of people use like an ounce or an ounce and a half weight with a small bait like that. And is that more just for the, you know, punching it through the stuff or is that more for the reaction bite? Like it's going to fall quickly because you're using such a small bait. Uh, both. I typically, if I'm going to air, I always air on heavier. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll be honest, I don't like two ounce weights. I try to s- steer clear of that. So if I can get a, most things in Florida, ounce and a quarter, ounce and a half is plenty. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are ways to get it through the vegetation. Right. Um, one of them being put a cricket. It's smaller. It's got less stuff to grab. You can put a cricket into places that you can't put a bigger plastic. You know? Right. Um, so... Uh, I like to air, even if I'm fishing a speed worm or a chatterbait or any of those things, I'm going to lean more towards like a half ounce than a three eighth ounce. Mm-hmm. I, when I stop the bait, I want it to fall quickly. And right. so I think it is that reaction that you're talking about okay. uh, and the heavier weight. So the, the lesson I got on the back of the boat the one day was about dead sticking, but it was... <laughs> Blind bed fishing is essentially what we were doing. Right. And forever I will, you know, think about that during the spawn, no matter (laughs) where I'm at. Um, And yeah, you know, at first you're like, yeah, it's the most boring thing. And then all of a sudden it's like time slows down or speeds up or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you'll, you'll start pitching and you start thinking about the way they're eating it. And then next thing you know, you're getting five or six bites in like 20 minutes because you're being really efficient about it. And what, what got you into that technique? Like what, how did you train yourself to get that? Cause I don't think that comes naturally <laughs> <laughs> to, to just like, look at, you know, a, a huge lake like the Harris chain or Kissimmee or, you know, any, any of those chains that, you know, you've got all this water to cover. How do you decide to slow down that much? Yeah. So, um, it didn't take me long in Florida, whether it be through dock talk or just learning from better anglers, you know, the, the fish slow in Florida. You know, it's a common thing. you got to slow down in Florida. Uh, well, 
uh, my buddy, one of my best friends, his name is Jay, and that was my tournament partner that when I lived in West Palm Beach, and uh, we would always joke, he, he was like the most impatient person in the world. <laughs> like, you know, he just had to move where I would slow down. And to try and get him to slow down while we were team fishing, you know, we would make jokes about like, I'm going to pitch it in there and I'm going to leave it until I, until the fish just can't stand it <laughs> and they're finally going to bite it. Yeah. Um, and we, I started like almost going overboard with how slow to fish. Like when you think you're fishing slow enough, slow down even more. And I just realized that, wow, you pick up a lot of bites, mm -hmm. you know, um, which then becomes the challenge is you got to find them, right. which fishing slow like that would take forever. So, you know, when you're preparing for a tournament, you've got to fish fast enough to find them. But once you get the clues that there are fish there, I mean, just throw your boat keys in the water and just <laughs> slow down. That's a, a, a Brian Thrift was laughing about Florida fishing and he said, you know, he, he always makes this mistake because he leaves fish mm -hmm. uh, because they're not biting because he's used to accustomed yeah, to everywhere works. else. He, he's he moves. got 100 waypoints he hits in a day sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. So he's always like, gosh, when I find him, I just need to throw my boat keys in the water and make myself stay there. And uh, so I've just, I'm a laid back guy in general. I'm not, you know, I'm always moving, but I've just, my personality uh, fits into that slow fishing. Uh, and I will say it does hurt me when I leave Florida. Right, right. Um, so when I leave Florida, uh, so Lake Norman, I uh, finished second and almost went back to the Classic the very next year. And we're dock fishing and all those things. Um, the, the guy that won, uh, Andy Montgomery, is the, you know, he, he won a tournament. That's his mm -hmm. home, one of his home lakes. And he probably fished 100 docks that final day. I probably fished 30. Wow. Because I uh, because I'm so slow, but I actually when I leave Florida, I put uh, reminders in my phone. Keep moving, keep moving. Because like my nat my natural instinct, if I got bit on a dock in a cove, I'm gonna fish for two hours in that cove, and you can't do that. Yeah, you, you yeah. Could, you do that in Florida, but you can't do that elsewhere. Yeah, in that place it's more of a size thing. Sometimes even it's not even that you're not getting bit. It's your you know, you're getting bit, so you're like, I know there's like 10 more fish under there. Right, right. Well, this was in October. Yeah. Uh, September, October. So yeah, I fished was, that one. Yeah, so yeah. you weren't getting 100 bites like you do in the spring. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it was a little more difficult. But once you dialed in on how to get a bigger fish to bite, uh, then that's all I did. So. Yep, yep. Well, Rich, I want to I want to thank you for coming out and uh, and making the trip over here to to Inverness to to talk to me. But yeah, um, you're always like like I said, the voice of reason and <laughs> and you know the the more you know centrally just overall the the guy to talk to when when everything's going south. You, you bring you bring some sort of light to the situation. So <laughs> I appreciate it. I, uh, I have enjoyed getting to know you and some of the. The crew up here, uh, we were talking earlier, you know, mm -hmm. my introduction to Inverness folk, I guess, uh, <laughs> was was Robbie Crosno and uh, George. And, Capstone, George. Yeah. and, you know, I, I was there when Robbie won mm -hmm. his first co-angler event, the regional and all that. And we had a whale of a good time that night. And ever since then, I have then, through mm -hmm. Robbie and George, you know, have met so many people. Uh, like yourself mm -hmm. and uh, you know Trevor and yeah, yeah. Uh, Trevor you know. Fitzgerald uh, he he linked a bunch of stuff too as far as uh, for me especially just around you know the fishing industry around here he he cut a lot of corners for me on mm -hmm. you know telling me who I needed to talk to to get the shop started correctly and yeah you know he was the first rod company I brought in um, and he'll be on the podcast here soon enough too I'm yeah sure. uh, Tre um, Trevor and I are. are very, very tight. And, yep. uh, you know, he's, he was, he's one of those guys I would do absolutely anything for. Yep. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad you're going to have him, but, uh, it's been fun to get to know, uh, the, the expand the people I know over here, like yep. Laramie and, you know, yeah, I, yeah. those guys, I just, I never knew. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so. they, they've mainly fish on the FLW side these days. And, you know, sometimes you don't cross cross paths with all those guys Yeah, very that, true. that mainly fish that side of things. Um, you know, you try to pick your schedules where you're going to be and yeah. you can't always align it to, to be around everybody at the same time. What's but. crazy is FLW would always like, when you look at a schedule, like that, 
those lakes would fit me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not the bass side. Right. But, uh, my goal is to try to get back to the classic, not yep. especially the FLW. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, each event is precious for me in a year because I'm only going to do a couple of them, you know, four yeah. at the most. So uh, I still I stick with going to places like Hartwell and yeah Cherokee and all that. Looking forward to those those events <laughs> in Lay Lake now. It's been announced, uh, and uh, by the time this goes out, we'll be we'll be just be getting back from Hartwell, I think. And uh, gotcha. So so good. you'll be a classic qualifier. Well, I, I mean, I think, I mean, I might get second to you. I mean, I, heck, I'd like a top ten. That'd be great. I'd just shoot for a top ten right now. Yeah, but, that, you mean, know, that's the thing. Make the first cut, and just like going to the classic, like you spend the rest of your time trying to go back there. Make that first cut and fish the final day, and you'll you'll chase that. You know, every absolutely. year it's it's a, it's special. Just making a cut in these things is is pretty. But pretty special. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you again, uh, once again, um, for, for coming out. Where can they find you online uh, as far as social media profiles, if anybody wants to reach out to you? Or... Yeah. Uh, I've got a, a Rich House Fishing, you know, Facebook page. You can find me just my personal page, Rich House. I'm just searching through Facebook. I've got uh, Rich House Fishing Instagram, uh, Rich House Fishing Twitter. I don't really tweet, but... Uh, <laughs> I know it's out there somewhere and they're connected. Um, and then, uh, of course, you know, just Google my name and insurance and, you know, my my insurance offices would come up as well. And as always, uh, you can find me at Chris Kingery Fishing on any of the social networks as well as uh, Chris Kingery dot com is where uh, I host this podcast and, and you can see all the episodes as well as iTunes and uh, on YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe. Uh, we're going to have many more down the pipe here and I'm, I'm really excited about where this is going. Uh, once again, thanks Rich for, for coming out and I uh, uh, can't wait to see what we got next. All right, man.